Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to session 14A in the Gospel of John. We're going to be uh, covering really uh, 9 through probably 17 today. We'll see how far we get. We're not quite sure how far we'll get. Uh, but before we uh, go into just 9, where he had said these things, he remained in Galilee. I want to go back and pick up 6 through 9 because it kind of ends with a, a section there. It says, verse six says, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that of its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet truly come. Then verse nine, where we're picking it up at, it says, when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So let's put it in context of where we are. Uh, the Gospel of John through the at the end of chapter one to probably the end of chapter four is what's called the, the period of obscurity of ministry. It's a year of ministry that's not covered in the other Gospels. And then from five on to where we are at six, it's almost two years between the end of verse four and uh, chapter six, verse four of chapter four. I mean, chapter four and verse uh, one of chapter six. What happens is that in the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they pick up that, that other period that John doesn't pick up. So as we entering here, uh, Jesus has just got through talking with the, the people, many of them has left him in chapter six, and now he's going up to the temple, but his brothers are asking him to go with him, and he's saying, no, my time has not come, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. So that's kind of how we went through last week. We went through that uh, even his brothers didn't believe. They wanted him to go up. He didn't go up, most likely, because he knew the Jews, the leader of the Jews would be looking for him. And they would be looking for the people coming in in the crowd. They'd be looking for uh, Jesus and his following, and they could find him. So as we enter into verse nine, that's where he is. And when he says, when he had not, when he had said these things, he remained in Galilee. Uh, so the first question that we come to that we haven't covered last week is what is the role's timing? The, what is the role of God in his timing? I'm sorry. What is our role? Yeah. What is our role in God's timing? Yeah, I'm having a hard time following what I'm reading. <laughs> so when you look at the, what what is our role in God's timing, what's your thoughts around that? Well, his time is not our time. He's got a... That's what I think about that uh, particular thought. He's not. He he's he's, he's an earth for an earth for a reason, and we are just living. That's that's, a, that's how I how what I get from that. Okay. I, I think the question. How about if I pose the question a little bit differently? God okay. has time. His timing. We know God has his timing. What is our role in that? Do we have a role? Do we just sit back yeah. and we don't do anything? Do we? Well, yes, he's got a role to, uh, to for us to learn. But uh, um, uh, Jesus's time hasn't come because his father hasn't. It, it's in God's here. time, not our. Oh, God time or even Jesus's time. Jesus is just follow. Do we yeah. have any part to play in that? Okay. Do you have any part playing in that? Yeah, let's let me, let me try to get into a little bit of where yeah. you see where we're coming from. The question is confusing <laughs> uh, a little bit and we're just trying to generate you know, what the thoughts are around this. But the, the issue here is, if you look at Jesus, when he says, my time has not yet come, right. really, 
it really did not mean that Jesus didn't have the power to go up to Jerusalem, that he didn't have the will to go up to Jerusalem and prove himself. Uh, what he said is, I'm going to not only be obedient to God in what he wants me to do, the will in which he's pointing me, but it's just important to be, to be obedient to God in his timing of his will. And what we get is a little bit of, we get frustrated because we think we understand God's will, but it may not be God's timing for us to do that will. I don't know whether that makes sense. The point here is, as you mentioned, Juan, totally correct. Times God's timing is not our timing. It's not our timing. Right. But his ways are not our ways. So what this question is getting to, Jesus had the will to go. He had the power to go. He had everything to go, but it wasn't within God's timing. And right. so even though he's obeying God from a will standpoint, he's also obeying God from a timing standpoint. Many times right. we're, on, we're impatient. In other words, you know, we ask God for something. We think that's in his will. But we want to go do it, and it's not God's timing yet. And so the, what this question is getting to is the importance of acting on God's timing as well as God's will. For, for example, it's a, hard, it's a hard area to really gain a complete understanding of. Uh, I felt like God had a calling for me to teach and teach the Bible. I felt like, I felt that calling of God, and I think, I thought it was the will of God, and I still think it is the will of God, but God didn't want me to go out and teach until it was, until he had prepared me to do that. He said, well, what are you talking about, Dave? Well, the fact is, I had the will to go, but the fact is, I was being held back because I don't think God's timing that I had the background to really teach according to where he wanted me to teach. So I had to be patient, and it was years before I finally said, I think God's ready for me to go out. So even though I had this will to do this, I had to be patient until the timing was right. It has come. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether that makes sense. That's kind of a little bit yes. of a story. Uh, yes. So it's difficult sometimes to understand God's timing. And that's the point here. We have to be obedient to his timing, and that's that's difficult. It's hard enough sometimes to say, is this God's will? Got to be careful. Because other we can get influenced by other worldly things, and we yeah. think it may be God influence and it may not. So it's really not a black and white. It's really, you've got to let your heart, it's basically your heart needs to tell you, your Holy Spirit needs to direct you. This is God's will, but we also need to recognize, is it God's timing? And that's that's what we're trying to ask here, is the importance of both the will and the timing. Juan, you said something that I thought was very important, and it was, it was very important. Uh, well thought out. And you said God's timing is not our time. I don't know where you were going with that, but what I wanted to explain is the time as we understand it, days, weeks, months, years, that doesn't exist in heaven. That doesn't exist in God. That timing is man-made timing that God allowed us to set up in order that we may have a chronological view of history, presence, and future. It's hard to comprehend. We will not comprehend it until we get to heaven. God has no past, present, or future. He has no time. Time's not one of his dimensions. So when he looks at us, he actually sees us in the past as now, the present is now, and the future is now. We can't comprehend that because we think of past experiences or one thing, present day life is one thing, and future something else. He doesn't see it that way. 
And so my point is, it's very difficult to get a complete understanding of God's timing because we can't understand a dimension without time. And that's what he in. He was here before. He was here during. He was here after. He's during this whole time frame of before creation, during creation, after creation. He's always present, omnipresent. Uh, uh, he's always in this same concept of no time. That's hard to understand. It's hard to comprehend. It's like trying to comprehend the Trinity. God is one and only one God, but he comes in three persons, the God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, that is a dimension we as human beings do not have the capability to grasp. You, you, you cannot understand that fully. You can guess at it and try to give examples of it. We can't. So the point I'm trying to make is God's timing is important, but it's also difficult for us. Yes, right. Jesus knew God's timing. Why? He was God, right? We don't have that privilege. We don't have that privilege. But we do have the privilege of trying to ask the Holy Spirit that's within us to let us know whether or not this is the timing after they have told us this is the will. So anyway, a, a long explanation of this. Well, we could just say, well, it wasn't God's timing. We could have rested it and just sat and moved on. But we got to understand his timing works with us as well. Except we're not Jesus. Yeah. We don't understand the timing as clearly as Jesus did. You had something? Yeah. So, any other questions or comments? Uh, well, I said, uh, when I said uh, the timing, that's, that was God's will on Jesus to uh, give us give him some a certain time to do to do what he's doing for us to teach us uh, the word of God to set to prepare us for the for heaven and his time that was his preaching until it was time for her to go and let us figure us out, figure us after he left, what's, you know, what's, uh, for me, it's uh, what I'm going to do or what I should do. And I have, and he showed me through what is the, you know, the best way to go about it. Yeah. yeah. Any, any sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. The thing I'm going to say for clarity is what you're saying makes perfectly sense for us today. Yeah. What we're looking at, though, is God had a plan for Jesus. Right. And he had a plan for his ministry and a plan for his for crucifixion that. and a plan for his death. Right. That timing God had already laid out. And Jesus True. knew that timing. So he's work, he's walking in obedience to that timing, knowing that there's a greater plan for him for our salvation. Right. And we are similar, except God has a plan for us. But it's not it's not, not, our, a plan, not you know, it's not a plan we understand completely. Jesus understood yeah. the plan the plan completely. Yeah. And so while he was obedient and had the ability to be obedient. Sometimes we want to be obedient, but we don't have that same capability because we don't know the plan and Jesus knew the plan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So many obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go ahead and read this passage, um, John 7, 9 through 13. And when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But after his brother had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly but in private the jews were looking for him at the feast and saying where is he and there was much muttering about him among the people while some said he is a good man another said no he is leading people astray yet for fear of the jews no one spoke openly of him so last week we see the brothers were trying to encourage jesus to go to Jerusalem with them for the feast. They said, hey, your disciples are there waiting. They want to see all this stuff happening. Well, why wouldn't you prove yourself? You know, that's what we talked about last week. So he told yeah. them, you guys go ahead. My time's not ready. And then he goes anyway. So do you think he was being deceptive 
when he told his brothers to go to the fest festival without him? No. Okay. No, it wasn't his time. Okay. So by saying it wasn't his time to go publicly, which if he went in with his brothers and everybody was watching for him and they were making a hoopla about his thing, then that it, it, he said it wasn't his time to go publicly. He didn't say it's not my time to go at all. He didn't say I'm not going to the feast. He never said that. He right. said it's not yet my time. You go, mm -hmm. um, you go ahead. It's not my time yet. And right. so we want to make sure we read it carefully um, that we understand he was not being deceptive because some people will try to point out, oh, look, Jesus said one thing and did another. But here what we're seeing is, is that he went there, but he went privately. Privately. He wanted to go privately. Yeah. Right. He, he wanted to go with his brothers and sisters. Right. He just but wanted to go himself when his time came. I don't think I don't I was think my thought was that um God didn't want this to turn into a circus and that he uh Jesus went in to hear what was going on, what could be what these people could be believing or not. And that's what I that's how I felt about it. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. Yeah, and I think all the everything I said, I think is said, has been has been very right on target. I want to add some context to this that I started off in the beginning. This is the last Passover that Christ will go to. All right, this is this is the Passover he goes to and. By the time we get done with this, he's going to be crucified. You understand? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So what was his triumphal entry in which he came publicly and proclaimed, here's the king? He came riding in on a donkey. We're going to get that later on, on a coat of a donkey. Right. And allowed himself to be proclaimed as king publicly. That's the timing. For him to go up now, that was not the timing for him mm. to go publicly. So he came in, we I don't he came in secret, but he is going to be announcing himself publicly. As you as you said, God will allow him to come in on the coat. That's Palm Sunday. If you if you recognize Easter and Palm Sunday, that's where they right, yes. the palms down and everybody. Uh, Hosea of the highest. Here's the and he. That's the timing. He goes totally public with his ministry coming in. So when you look at the context of this, we're leading up to that, and so he's going into Jerusalem for that event, but it's not Palm Sunday yet, and so it's not his time to come in publicly. Remember the the, the feast of booths, right? It's before, and I think the feast of the booths happens in the fall. Doesn't it? And no, we'll come in right into it, one it's, right after the other. Okay, so it's in the spring, but we've got we don't have Passover. We we're we're not at Passover yet. We've got weeks and weeks, I think, to go right. before we're at Passover. Yeah, as we go into John, what we get into here is this feast of booths that's going on now. It goes up to the feast. Then we get into uh, really the Passover, the upper room discourse to his disciples. And if you know where Nolly is in his study, remember last week, he was in John 15. John 15 is the middle of his discourse with his disciples when he had his last supper. So here we are in chapter seven. I think it's 13, 14, 15, and 16. He's with his disciples in the upper room. So we don't have a long time between now and that event. Right. The fact, the fact is, he's entering Jerusalem, but not as king of kings, as a Messiah, that he comes in on Passion Week and uh, the Passover. So we just need to recognize that, and we'll get into all that as we move through this. So the other thing I want to note here that it's easy to miss, it says, as yet 
for the fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Right. Right. Okay. There, what, there are you, the leaders right. judging what, them or yeah. whatever. What Jews? What Jew is? What Jews are you talking about? The um, rabbi, the leaders. All right. So it's very important, Gene, to catch that because it says, "Yet for fear of the Jews, who are at this festival, the Jews. Every Jewish man has to go to this festival. So all the Jews mm -hmm. there. So when." John is using for fear of the Jews. When he uses this fear of the Jews, he's talking about the Sadducees, Pharisees, the Pharisees, high yes. priest. It's the leadership of the Jews that are against Jesus. And not all of those are. Remember Nicodemus right. was of the Pharisees and he came to Jesus secretly at night back in chapter yeah. 3. Yeah. So it's not all of them. So when he talks about the fear of the Jews, he's talking about this group that's against him. He's not talking about the Jewish group as a whole. And we, we, so whenever you see that, and I'm just pointing that out, that's something to consider that he's talking about the people, the Jewish leadership that are pursuing him to really kill him. And I just right. want to make sure there's no confusion about this. So this started off telling us that this was the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles does happen in the fall about October. Okay. And then Passover, when he comes to Passover, that's not going to happen until mid-April. So this is several months before, just so we don't confuse what Dave was saying about him coming in, this is his last Passover. This is his last Feast of Booths. Right. It's also his last Passover. When he, goes when, when he gets there in a few months. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're good? We're good. All We're right. Good. So this next question is a question you may have heard before. Different people have put it different ways. Is what is worse to call Jesus a good man, a deceiver, or a lunatic? Uh, I, I wrote down deceiver. I think that's the right answer, but. Uh... If I get that, to see him, if to see I, what is the worst to call Jesus a good man? Well, they call him a good man. Yeah. I, I but the question says, says to me, the question is, what is, is worse? Not what is good. So what is worse to call Jesus? The que my, that question, to what I answer it, is to deceive it. Me too. Yeah. Because... Uh, Jesus, we know, was a good man, right? And he definitely was not a lunatic. Right. But well, for for that and, question, what is you know, what is worse, the good man or a deceiver? So, a lunatic or a lunatic that's right? a crazy person, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. so that you know, the scripture says a good man, okay? But my the question is that what is. Worse, the, the word worse Jesus. is the worst, you know, what is the worst to call mm. Jesus? So I, my answer was a deceiver, but I know he was a good man. But right. the word the word worse yeah. in a yeah. question, it makes me feel like, he, you know, that they were calling, and they, they wasn't calling, what do you, you know, to make, uh, just the word worse is just, you know, like, uh, it's a tricky question. Right, it's something that you, know, you can't you can't grab it because the, the, we know Jesus was a good man, as the scripture said. Right, so, and let let me put a spin on this because the question is to to generate you know your thoughts, mm -hmm. and I think ninety nine percent of the people that would answer this would say. It'd be worse to call him a deceiver, yeah, right. than anything else. Because a lunatic yeah. is a crazy person, so you don't want to. Right. He's a lunatic. We know he did good things. He did miracles. Good, thing. good person. Right. He was yeah. he was loving. Right. We know that. So right. most people will say it's a deceiver, but actually, most commentators, 
and hold on to your pants here. Most commentators, <laughs> it's worse to call Jesus a good man. Yeah. It is to call him a deceiver or a lunatic. Yeah. You say, well, wait, wait, how does that make sense? Right. How that a makes good sense. man would not say he is God. All right. All right. Only a liar or a lunatic or crazy person would say such a thing. You and I will never complain. We may be good people. We may good be do good deeds. We would never say we're God. Jesus said he was God. I am. I and the Father are one. So to say he's a good man is denying that he is God. Jesus is not a good man. Jesus is God. And the thing we see in Jesus, the Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is a human quality of him. And we are judging the human quality. Again, I don't want to be confusing, but the fact is, he's not a good man. He's God. And I think the way you said it the first time, Juan was actually accurate. Best thing to do is call Jesus, Jesus is God. You say, well, he was a good man. He was a good man. But you say he's a good man. You're saying he's not God. That's what they're saying. Oh, yes, that makes but sense. They're, they're saying not... the deceiver, mm. we have a lot of deceivers in this world, or he's a lunatic. And the point here is, is what they're trying to get across is that the fact is, is that we have to look at Jesus and make a determination. Was he a good man? Which many people said, as Annette wrote, he's a good guy. Others said, well, no, he's demon. He's got a demon in him. He's deceived. He's whatever. Or he's just a crazy person. Let me tell you, it would take a crazy person to go to the cross and shed our blood in what he went through. The, and not only the cross, look at what he went through with the the lashing and the whips and the trap. Look at the what he went through. That no no crazy man or deceiver would ever do that. So we reason we reason out deceiver or lunatic pretty quick by what he demonstrated he was willing to go through to prove who he was. Plus, obviously, his resurrection uh, cleared all that up. So the fact that they focus on is a lot of people say he's a good man, and when we deal with our People today, I'm talking about in our world today, as well as the world back then when Jesus was walking the earth. It's dangerous to refer to, refer to Jesus as a good man. I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, Jesus was good. Uh, he had love in him. He treated people gently. He was good to children. They're missing the point. Jesus is God. Jesus is our only way to God. Yes, he's a good man, but to call him a good man is discounting the reason he was here. The reason he was here not to be a good man, the reason he here was here was not to do miracles. The reason was he we came here was to go through and be the perfect sacrifice to shed his blood for us, to forgive us of our sin and be resurrected on the third day to give us eternal life. That's different than calling Jesus just a good man. You see what I'm saying? It's yes, dangerous because the world yeah. we live in, if you'll talk about Jesus, you know what most people will say? Oh, he was a good guy. He never claimed to be God. Right. You know, he may have been a prophet. Yeah. He may have been a good God. Actually, the, the Muslims believe he was a prophet. And I mm -hmm. think Jehovah Witness believes he's just a good man. So major religions recognize he was a prophet or he was a good man, but only Christianity recognizes he was man and God as one that came here, was the perfect sacrifice on the cross, shed his blood, and gave us the power of forgiving our sins, our, inequity, our inequities, and our trespasses, past, present, and future, and back to past, present, and future. God knows no time. So when Jesus hung on the cross and our sins were forgiven, it was past, present, and future sins that were forgiven. Because remember, God has no concept of time. 
So the pro the, I know I'm beating this dead horse <laughs> and I apologize, but the caution is as we're out in public and we're out being witnesses for Christ, right? A lot of people will not deny Jesus walked the earth. It's undeniable. But what they'll say, well, you know, he was just a good guy. He really wasn't God. He really never claimed to be God, which they didn't read the scripture if they known that. And others will say, well, he was a prophet. He seemed to be a, a, a prophet. And they would have read the scripture and known that wasn't true as well. You had so, yeah, I kind of would just like to kind of bring this around and clarify that this scripture right here, uh, verse 12, uh, the people were talking among them others and saying, oh, he's a good man or no, he's leading people astray. So this. Question, right. That's, that's this, what I really understand. Right. Yeah. He was leading people astray for another. Well, uh, this is let me let me tell you what's going. This question should have been saying about these people back then because if i ask you today who was jesus you're not going to say he was a good man you're going to say he's the son of god he was god right that's your right. answer right. so if i say who was jesus you're not going to say oh he was a good man and so that's what these people were saying and what we're david's trying to say to say he was a good man is saying he's not god you know otherwise okay. you say he's god and you you today if i say who is jesus christ you're going to say he's god and so Correct. that's where this question kind of was going, just to kind of wrap it up. Yeah. Right. And Oof. so why, why were they afraid of the Jews and they didn't speak of them openly? Because they could have they could have been killed or well um, yeah, what actually what was happening, and we're gonna get into this later on. Is if the Jewish leadership thought you talked good about Jesus, you were expelled from the synagogue. So you were expelled yeah. from all yeah. of Jewish activities. You were kicked right. out of the synagogue, kicked out of the Jewish community completely. So their fear of the Jews is they didn't want to speak openly about Jesus, regardless, because the fear of the Jews yeah. would kick them out of the synagogue. Yeah. So and right. let's get to the next question. We'll sum this up. So this kind of goes right along. So, you know, some people say they want to be indifferent about God. Well, I don't ever Jesus. I don't know if he's God or if he was a man. I don't know. I, I don't even care. And it's really hard to be indifferent about Jesus because he made absolutely outrageous claims. You know, he you either believe Jesus or you don't. Um, I don't think that you, you can't say, well, I believe about half of what he said. Well, if you believe half of what he said, that means he lied about the other half and he's a liar. You know, so we don't want we either believe Jesus Christ 100 percent or we don't believe him. And yes. so you can't truly believe he died on the cross. Um, that's just one really important thing. If Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin. How can we continue to willfully and purposely sin? We can't do that. We can't be indifferent. We can't say, oh, well, he died on the cross and my sins are forgiven. So no worries. I can do whatever I want. We cannot think like that because that is not um, respecting or that's not acknowledging the work that he did on the cross for us. Right. If you think about the things he did um, that were outrageous, he said he came down from heaven. Well, a man wouldn't say I came down from heaven. He said that he had, he had ex existed for all eternity. He existed before the earth and he will continue after. He said he was sent by his father. He, so he was saying he was the son of God. He claimed that he knew everybody's eternal um, destiny. He said he knew what happened to everybody. He said he was the savior of the world. He claimed to be, you know, all kinds of things. He just made so many outrageous claims that if he wasn't God, then he is crazy. And if he is God, you can't be indifferent about it. You can't right. say, you have to acknowledge just how amazing and incredible it was. But the biggest thing I want you to know is we can't be indifferent about the work you did on the cross because you will see people that what Dave said was true. All of our sins are forgiven. The ones that I committed in my past, the ones I will commit today, 
and the ones that I'm going to undoubtedly commit in my future. My sins are forgiven. But the fact that Christ died on that, I cannot be complacent or flip about it. I can't just pass it off and say, oh, great. Now I have a free license to do whatever I want. It, it, that's not the way it works. You can't possibly feel that way when you know what he went through for you and for me. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to note, because uh, we kind of discount this, is that once you accept Christ, Christ is in you and you are in Christ. When you hear the body of Christ, don't confuse that with the body of the church. You and I are of a body of the church, right? We're members of believers, uh, Hope Bible Church, but not only Hope Bible Church, all Christian-based churches. We're members of the church. But when Christ said, you are a member of me and I am a member of you, or you are in me and I am in you, that is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Christ is residing in us via the Holy Spirit. So if we sin, we have a conflict inside of us because the Holy Spirit, Christ, is said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And we're doing it, right? So we're, we're at conflict internally. So we can't continue. Will we sin? Yes. But continual sin, repetitive, intentional sin, is usually an indication you need to check where you are. Because Christ is, but you can't sin if Christ is in you. This issue about indifference about Christ, I've heard it put this way. And again, I don't want to be blunt here. You believe in Christ, you accepted him. You're kind of thinking about him. You're on the fence post here, you know. You kind of lean in, well, I know about him. I'm kind of, or I don't believe there, there is Christ. Only the first category goes to heaven. Being kind of on the fence post, kind of indifferent, don't get you there. That's Ooh, just yeah. as bad as saying he doesn't exist. So that's why it says you can't be indifferent about Christ. It has to be Christ and only Christ. There is no Ooh. other way. So that's why we're, we're kind of belaboring this a little bit. So any thoughts before we go to the next section of scripture here? I'm there. <laughs> I'm there with you. All right. Continue. Okay, 14 through 18. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them. Now we'll stop here. They're not talking to Jesus. They're talking among themselves. Mm -hmm. But Jesus knows what they're saying. So that's why he answers them. Mm -hmm. So Jesus answers them. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking from my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him, there is no falsehood. So see what Jesus is saying. If you want to proclaim something because of you want to show who you are, that's not what God expects. That's kind of the word. He's proclaiming for the glory of God, not for his own cause. So with that, we get into the first question is, how did the way Jesus taught differ from the ways of others taught? And the Sadducees and Pharisees were teachers of the times. Uh, scribes were teachers. So there was a lot of people teaching. Uh, I'll get into this teaching here in just a, this formal, that's a later question. But how is his teaching different from the other teaching? And you Jesus may not know yet. The truth. Do what, Jane? Jesus only taught the truth. And um, um, he was, 
he was able to, well, he only spoke the truth of the, of the time and of these individuals. Well, two, two of these individuals. Yeah, and what you're saying, I think, is accurate. Jesus only tells the truth. Because what he's talking about is coming from God the Father. Right. And right. So when you look at scripture, scripture is Jesus' word, it's truth. And so I think what you're saying is accurate, but the people don't know whether he's speaking of truth and or not. He's proclaiming it's not his words, but he's proclaiming right. these are the words from God. Yeah. So, right. Okay. That is different to some degree, but re recognize. Many of the prophets, and remember, a prophet is not only someone telling the future, it's also someone explaining scripture. They'll be called a prophet as well. A prophet many times did get it directly from God, and they said they're speaking from God. And if a God and if a prophet is speaking and a recognized prophet of, of God, they're getting the word from God what they're speaking. We're talking about the other teachers that people hear are, are listening to. The last prophet, who was the last prophet on, on this earth? Oh, boy. Who was Abraham. It? Do what? Abraham. Abraham. No? No. Okay. Let's the last prophet. Wouldn't that be Jesus? J Jesus wasn't a prophet. He's, he's God. So I discount him. That's a good, good answer, but I'm taking him out of the equation. Okay. The last prophet recorded in the Old Testament is uh, Malachi. That's the oh, last yeah. book of the Old Testament. The first book of the New Testament is Matthew. That's 400 years of silence. Okay, between Malachi and Matthew, which is the first book in the in the New Testament. So you have 400 years of silence. We can go fill that in with history, but it's not in our Bible. Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament, and the first prophet in the New Testament is John the Baptist, and he's the last prophet that ever existed. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And so the reason I'm saying this is because, because John the Baptist was the last prophet. He was speaking directly from what the words of God. He, oh, that's right. He's yes. dead and gone. He's beheaded by this time. We don't get to that here, but that's, that's gone. So the people are not listening to John the Baptist anymore. They're listening to the teachers that are there, the teachers in the synagogue. And where I'm heading with this is that when you get to the end of uh, the Gospel of John, which we'll get there, so I'm, I'm skipping to the end, but it tells us what that why people were so at all at Jesus. It's because he spoke like no other man. No one ever heard a man speak this way. He spoke with absolute authority. Other people were teaching what they had been taught by someone else. A, 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 for example, a student of the Bible followed a rabbi, which is a teacher, and they would follow them for years and years and years, and they just taught what that rabbi taught, who taught what that rabbi who taught, who taught who that rabbi taught. So generations brought down. They didn't speak from the truth of God. Of God. They didn't speak as from God. They just taught what the word of God as they understood it from previous people. Remember, the Bible wasn't circular. The only way you could really get any Bible scripture was to go into the synagogue and listen to the scroll being written. Because remember, there were very few Bibles. Only a handful of the people had Bibles in this particular age and time because they were so expensive. They had to be hand rewritten. They had to be translation. They had to be basically manuscripts of what had already been written, been copied over. So he taught in a way that no one ever taught. And, and we'll get to it in, in a few weeks, 
where the Roman soldiers, well, it wasn't Roman soldiers, the Pharisee soldiers went to arrest him, and they couldn't arrest him because they said, this man talks like no other man. Yes. So he he taught and talked like no other person, and it was recognized by the people. And so that's why it was so different, is he taught from authority, he taught from God, he taught truth, as you said, Jane, but it was from the authority that you knew it wasn't uh, coming from a human state, a standpoint. You want anything else? No, um, I'll go to the next question. Uh, and we don't really have the answer here in this passage of scripture. So I'm just going to answer it. It said, how did the Jews attempt to discredit Jesus? Frequently, the Jews were, or, and especially like the Pharisees, they would come up with this question and, oh, let's try and trap him, you know. And what, what, there's different times where we see that in the scripture, like when they said, oh, if a woman's husband dies and she marries his brother and he dies and he marries his brother and he dies, you know, oh, who who's she married to with the resurrection, you know? So they're trying to trap him into saying something. The, the most famous one is where they bring him a coin and they think, oh, we're going to say, oh, is it is it right to pay tribute to Caesar? And so, you know, they can catch him there with blasphemy because they're supposed to not pay tribute to anybody but God. And, um, but they can get him in trouble with Rome if he says no, because they say, oh, he's telling us to uproar and not pay our taxes. So they were always trying to trick him. If the Jews could discredit him by messing up his logic or by finding fault in what he said, they definitely would have discredited him. But they couldn't. Everything he said, as Dave said, was with authority. It was all correct. It was all, as Gene said, truth. They couldn't find fault with what he said. So how do they how do they try to find fault about him? Um, they used bigotry and prejudice. You know, these learned people would say, how did this person without any learning, how can he speak this? And, um, you know, oh, he you know, he's doing this or, or they frequently said, oh, well, you don't have a real father back there and, and you're from Nazareth. You can't, you know, so they used a bunch of things to try to discredit him that had nothing to do with what he was saying. So just remember that the Jews did try to discredit him, but they were not able to because he was spoke with authority from God and he spoke as Gene said, truth. So the next question, the next question falls right into what basically Annette was saying here is does a lack of formal academic training disqualify someone from teaching God's word? No. No. And that's the obvious simple answer. No. If that was the case, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you and teaching you. Uh, if that was the case, there are many people you wouldn't be listening to. If that was the case, Christ wouldn't ask us to be witnesses to him all over the world and to proclaim the gospel, if that was true. But for the Jews, that is true in their own minds. So yes. let me get, get back to that, is that Jesus didn't follow a rabbi, at least not it's documented anyway. The rabbis didn't have it documented anyway. Remember, he was from Nazareth. Nazareth was kind of the wrong side of the tracks. It was up in the northern section. It was half reeds as long as with Jews. It was a mixed Gentile Jewish uh, area. Uh, it was noted for nothing good coming out of Nazareth. If you remember, Nathaniel said that. Uh, so he had no formal training that they recognized. When you remember, if you go to the Gospel of Luke, I think it's chapter 12, uh, and I may be wrong on that, but it says Jesus remained behind and was in the synagogue when his parents left and came back to Nazareth and they couldn't find Jesus. He was in the synagogue teaching and he was approximately 12 years old. So he had already known the word of God, even though he had no training whatsoever. Right. And he was just a child then, wasn't he? That's exactly. Yeah, he was around twelve, Luke says, but we don't we don't know exactly. We don't we won't have any other historical or any other biblical record of that other than what Luke says. Mm. So we know he had that ability, 
even back before any training could have happened. So what were they doing? When you say he has a lack of, of, of training, they know he wasn't trained by rab rabbi. They know he had no formal training. How in the world did he speak of these words? And what we, we look at the words he's saying, he quoted Old Testament from memory. He quoted their laws they made up outside of the Bible by memory. It can only come from God. Right. So he was able to, to quote stuff that no one else could quote, and they, they didn't know where he was getting it from. He's not a rabbi. He's not a Pharisee. How can he be possibly quoting our laws? Or can he be quoting the Bible? How is that possible? He probably doesn't even have a Bible. He's from Nazareth. Nazareth doesn't have a Bible, yeah. right? Maybe the synagogue there or two has well, one. Had scrolls, they not had a scroll. Bible. Well, they had a scroll, scrolls, right. but they didn't have all the scrolls. Right. So, right. so anyway, the, the point here is, is, I want to make it clear, is that by studying God's word, you know God, you understand God, you have a, a, a better relationship with God. You have fellowship with God. And that was that's what God wants you to do. He also wants you to take what you've learned and proclaim it. He, he wants us to be witnesses to the world outside of him. And to be witnesses outside of the world of him, you have to proclaim the word of God. Even though you haven't gone to seminary, you don't have a formal training. Now, with that said, uh, I'm going to be different a little bit here. And this is Dave Bodie's opinion. So take it as Dave Bodie's opinion. What did I say in my timing in teaching? I said, yeah. I felt like it was my, that God wanted me to, to teach but it wasn't my time to teach. So while I think we can be witnesses of Christ in certain ways, by the way we live, the way we act, the way we treat people, do we love our neighbors, the way that we're committed to God, we can show people God in us without teaching them. That is being a true witness. When it comes to making disciples and teaching, it takes a certain amount of time to study and understand God's word before you can communicate it to someone who may not understand it. So I don't think God is calling all of us, hey, all Christians on hand, go out and start being teachers. I differ with some people's opinion there because if you go to the Epistle of James, I think it's chapter three, again, don't quote me. We can go back and check that. It's unimportant which chapter, but it's chapter 3, verse 1. It says, not all believers are to be teachers because teachers will be judged more strictly than those that are not teachers. So James is saying, be careful. God is not calling all of us to be teachers. Remember, teaching is a spiritual gift. Teaching and preaching is a spiritual gift. He's not saying we all need to be preachers. He's saying we're not all to be teachers. Some we should teach. Some we should preach and teach. But the point I'm trying to make is, though Jesus had no academic training, his teaching and preaching came from a power that we don't have. But if you've been blessed by God with the spiritual powers to teach, God expects you to use it. He does. But look at Scripture, and it says not everyone should be teachers. There are some people that are meant to serve. It might be making refreshments at the end of church service, or it might be cleaning the church. Those are just as important to God worshiping God, than the person sitting in the pulpit teaching. Don't underestimate your work that you do for God as being trivial. 
It takes all work from all people to make a church, to make a whole Bible church, or to make any church. It takes everybody's effort doing their piece that they feel God has given them the power to do that. You know, some it's being handing out bulletins in the back. In some, it may be doing the uh, weekly announcement of services, or it may be reading a piece of a scripture that Jake asked them to read. There's all kinds of forms that I'm saying, but the fact is we're not required to all be teachers or preachers. And so we all are required to be witnesses of Christ. And how are we witnesses of Christ is what I just said. God counts it to worship, not because we get up and sing. That's important. God counts it to worship because we're doing things he gave us the ability to do for his church. That's where he counts worship. And we all have different abilities, and they're all just as important one to the other. I used to have a, a guy when I was you know, in management uh, and working that used to degrade himself. Look, I'm only this. You're the manager. And I used to say to this guy all the time, I said, look, without what you're doing, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing. Without each what each person's doing, Jake couldn't be doing what he's doing. So the fact is we all work together as a unit. So I want to make sure that it that we talk about Jesus' teaching, and he's qualified as a teacher. He's qualified as a preacher. Not all of us are, but we all are qualified to go out and proclaim Christ and proclaim by our character, by our behavior, by our words of who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. So I know I'm a little bit up on the platform, up on the pul pulpit preaching. I apologize for that. I'm supposed to be teaching, not preaching. But for that, any other comments before we get to the last Well, question? I'm following you. Yeah. You're making, you're making sense. You Absolutely. Yeah. You're you, you, you our horizon of... Um, Who's God? Who's okay. Jesus? Well, we're out of time, so let's just wrap up this last question. What's oh, what? required, yeah. required for us to comprehend God's will? And what is required? There's a few things. For one, the Holy Spirit is the most important thing. So by having the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit to help us understand is how we'll understand. We're not able to understand without the Holy Spirit. So that's the most important thing. But we also need obedience. I'm not going to understand um, God's will if I don't know the word of God. And how do I know the word of God? I study the Bible. Okay. And by studying the Bible, I understand who God is and what God wants for humanity. And through the combination of prayer, obedience to, to spend time in prayer, obedience to spend time in the word, obedience to spend time in classes like this. Um, this is how we learn or we can comprehend the will of God. It's through the things that, that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but we definitely need to be obedient um, to hear or to know. Okay. So any, any closing questions, comments, as we're up right up against our hour, it goes fast. I know. Oh, uh, but uh, <laughs> any questions, comments, or input, because we'll pick it up in verse 19 and finish chapter 7 next week, if God wills. If he doesn't yeah. will, yeah. God will. Right. So let's end in prayer, and then I will ask one comment after the prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Um, thank you for letting us know Jesus a little bit better. I think through just this last hour, we've learned that Jesus was not deceptive. That Jesus was not a lunatic. He was not a deceiver. He was not a good man. Jesus is God. And he was obedient to the Lord, the Father's timing. And that is a lesson to us that we need to be obedient to your timing and your will. So we just pray that you would help us recognize when you we need to follow you and when we're not doing it the way we should. So we just pray for your help in that. And I just thank you for the scripture you've given us today. In Jesus' name, amen.